Let's do this. YouTube success. Glory. Fame. Attention. Uh, I forgot to get my name. Good day, everyone. Welcome back to The Elliot Show. I'm the knife guy. Today, let's talk about people cheating. I wanna talk about some current events in pop culture and ask some questions and share my thoughts on the situations at hand. Specifically, I wanna talk about husbands today. Famous husbands, in fact. And I wanna ask specifically, why do famous husbands often cheat on their wives, causing disastrous things to happen to their public images and their private lives? Of course, you know who I'm going to talk about. You read the news. A few months back, of course, there was John Mulaney, which people were talking about for a while, him allegedly cheating on his partner, and that's a situation where, of course, there's no confirmation, but apparently it was a little sketchy, and that was a whole situation. It was more so a situation where, provably, he had sort of tarnished his wife guy reputation as a comedian, which was a big part of sort of his wholesome image. He wasn't the most wholesome comedian, but he certainly had a really strong connection with his audience that was in part to do with certain wholesome qualities he had. Then we can talk also about more recent events with Adam Levine, the lead singer and tattoo guy of Maroon 5, who, man, I mean, who didn't he cheat on his wife with? There was a lot of text messages that leaked, and that included his apparently years ongoing affair with a young woman by the name of Sumner, who apparently he told at one point that he would name his child after her. That's right, his unborn child that his pregnant wife was carrying while he was cheating on her with this young woman. He was going to name the child after her. I know a lot of you guys have heard this, but I still have to say it out loud to properly process how crazy that is. Then, one of the foremost head coaches in the NBA, Ime Udoka, who was well known to be the husband of Nia Long, a famous actress and widely regarded as one of the most beautiful women in the world, he apparently had a you know, the details of it aren't clear, but there was definitely an extramarital relationship that potentially was not consensual between the two parties. So that's also great. And then, of course, the fulcrum of this video, the one that really set the internet ablaze recently, Ned Fulmer, otherwise known as Ned from the Try Guys, who very famously talked often about how much he loved his wife and how great his wife was, uh, cheated on his wife with allegedly, and there's a lot of, you know, speculative evidence, but the evidence is pretty compelling, a person who works underneath him at the Try Guys and who has appeared in numerous videos. So all this keeps happening and people keep questioning it. And a lot of people are even calling for somebody to make a video about this. I don't know if my video is going to meet your expectations, but I do want to talk about some, let me not keep talking about what I'm going to talk about. So the first thing I want to talk about, let's answer a question. The question is, why do rich guys think they can do whatever they want? I mean, you have to have some ridiculous nerve to not only cheat on your wife, but to cheat on your wife after spending most of your energy publicly talking about how much you love your wife and staking a great part of your image on that. And then cheating on her in a very public situation with very little caution as to trying to like not let that get out. So dudes or non-dudes, Pretend to be a dude in this moment. Let's say you're a comedian or an entertainer of some sort and your goal is to become rich, famous, and well-liked. How do you make that happen? Well, to get rich, famous, and well-liked, you have to have a lot of luck. You have to have the luck to remain healthy. You have to have the luck to be able to socialize and perform consistently and have time to do your work to try to get famous for however long it takes. You have to be lucky enough to stumble on successful ideas. And then you have to be lucky to have the resources to execute on those ideas and the resources to deal with when those ideas don't come to fruition properly or when the results don't go as planned, which is most of the time, right? Like you have to have the resources to have a place to stay and to have enough money to keep sustaining yourself. And you have to have the luck, of course, for things to go right, for eventually one of those ideas to pop or one of those situations to bring you to that position. You have to have a lot of luck to be loved by strangers who you have no control over. And you have to have luck every single time that that success continues or grows over time. And you have to have a lot of luck for that to become lucrative enough to be a not only a career, but a very fashionable and sustainable career. So in other words, you have to be super lucky. And to think of yourself as 
being in control of that outcome enough for it to be a goal that you think you can just actively work to and maintain and control on your own as you get more and more famous, well, that requires a little bit of a false sense of self, right? You got to be pretty, I don't know, delusional even to think that that is how the world works, that suddenly you're going to get all these things purely from your own effort and not from things just happening well for you. And that means that if you find success, you're going to have a disconnect in understanding why you really found success. You might think it might be inherent to you naturally. That's a natural thing that happens to us all the time. Like we assume that the lives we live, you know, to a certain extent are the lives that we're supposed to live. And oftentimes when we try to interrogate that idea and ask like, why am I here? Why do I live here? Why do I have these things? It can be very difficult for us to, to deal with. So to have all that success and to try to rationalize it, a lot of the time it ends up, whether you know it or not, leading to you thinking you just naturally deserve things. It's an ultimate reality that you can embrace because you deserve it. You earned it, you know, earned it. I mean, even if you worked really hard and you do great things, there's a degree to which you just can't earn certain things. It's just luck. And that's hard. You know, it's hard to say, actually, I went through a lot of different random circumstances and I happen to excel in some of them and now I'm here. But most of this is out of my control. It's hard because then what do you have to feel proud of yourself? And how do you deal with the reality that so many other people like you might not have gotten there? For a lot of people, it's hard to live with yourself when you're dealing with that. So rather than try, you might as well just come up with a little myth in your head. And sometimes that disconnect and insecurity that you live with, with that myth or without that myth, is what causes you to convince yourself you deserve your luck, you deserve what happens to you, and other people similarly deserve what happens to them, which leads to a lot of hurtful and spiteful attitudes about other people. This is part of what we can call survivorship bias, which is a psychological phenomenon in which one person, because they see the outliers that are successful more than they see the many different cases of lack of success, think that, well, there is a parity between success and failure, or that more people succeed than fail. And there's also a lot of different variants of that. I think of survivorship bias oftentimes with like our experiences with older people. A lot of us have experienced older people often in our family expressing resent towards people who think society needs to get better, who are trying to change society to make it more fair. Because their experience, the older people's, have been so pleasant that they can't imagine other people have experienced something different without having done something wrong. And sometimes this is, you know, very loaded. Like there's a lot of poor people from other countries who emigrate to the United States and get success over here and then say that our systems, as a result, are fine. And if you're poor or from another country and poor, you just need to work really hard and don't give up and things will work out. And if they don't, then that's because you didn't work hard enough, right? This is the low key justification, sometimes high key justification that folks like that who come from the sort of rags to riches background will do because that's what they did. They worked hard, they got there, so why can't anybody else? Well, you'd have to acknowledge how much of it is luck. And you know, especially if you're coming from a really terrible background, how can you say you're lucky when you think about all the things that you dealt with? It's a hard, thing of multiple truths to parse through. And oftentimes people can become spiteful in this ideology because people can be very, very mean and very, very defensive of the things that prevent them from feeling insecure. Like if I truly don't deserve this, all these good things that I've gotten, then who am I? What is good about me? How do I process the traumas that I went through and justify them? How do I process the traumas that I dealt to other people. If it's truly not normal and lucky to come from poverty or to come from a tough background and to get to a really good place and it truly doesn't have anything to do with me, then how different am I from that person who is going through the terrible things? I think this survivorship bias idea is relevant when we talk about 99% of rich and famous people. They spent significant time in their lives being told that they're essentially gods. They're pillars of our culture who did incredible things purely from hard work and integrity. And oftentimes folks can become neglectful of other people, neglectful of other people's feelings and taking for granted their success as a given since they can moralize it and say they deserved it and not merely just being lucky. So if you're in that position we talked about earlier, you're that dude and you become famous and successful. 
And now that you're famous and successful, it's worth noting you're gonna get in a lot of situations where you get tempted to do all kinds of things that you can get away with now because people look up to you and people want things that you have. You become less and less concerned with the feelings of others. You become less concerned with your morality and the morality of your decisions. And you even become less concerned with maintaining your success because you've internalized it as not even a result of your decisions, but as something that is morally deserved by you. You aren't a person who does good things at this point. You are the good guy. And if being the good guy is just guaranteed to you, you simply don't even have to do good things to maintain that status. And if you do, boy oh boy, that's gonna boost your ego even more because look, I did a nice thing. Doesn't this reinforce how good of a guy I am, naturally? So it just spirals. And now let's talk about wife guys. Girls like so say you're rich and famous and you really want to relate to people that you are in fact a good guy. You wanna maintain this image with yourself and the world around you. What do you do? Well, you could be charity guy, but most people feel like they're not rich enough for their charity to make a difference. And plus, charity takes a lot of effort and research and can sometimes go wrong. And so sometimes it's better to kind of not try. You can also be politics guy, but God knows nobody wants to be that. I mean, that actively can compromise your income and your social standing. A lot of people are going to turn against you for your politics, including some people who have power over you. and. Part of the thing that you care about the most is how other people feel about you, that they like you, right? That you maintain this position of power and grow it. So you're not gonna do anything to compromise that, forget it. Well, you know what's relatively easier than doing those things? Be a wife guy. We live in a society, wink, that prioritizes monogamy and marriage, where for the most part, people think that being straight is the normal way to go. Even if they don't think that actively, they might think it subconsciously. And so as a man, especially as a straight man, it's incumbent that you eventually find that great girl, the one you're gonna love to death, the one you're gonna marry and start a family with. And when you're a celebrity, you ultimately get more liked when you reinforce standards of society. Maybe it's that you give back to where you're from. Maybe it's that you smile a lot. These things are cultural norms that are imposed. And so when celebrities live up to them, it's a signifier that they're good people which is great for systems to reinforce that they make sense because look, good people do good things, so that's why it's a good thing and you should do it. So you go get yourself a wife, but that's not enough. You can't just have a wife and then just talk about it honestly or middlingly, like, oh, you know, it's a fine relationship. We might break up at some point. I like her, but sometimes we have issues. No, you gotta big this thing up. You gotta celebrate your wife everywhere you go. You gotta constantly talk to people about how much you love your wife and then therefore how much you love this position, this cultural norm. And the more you do this, the more good feedback and admiration you get because everybody's trained to be like, oh, that's so great. You love your wife, what a good person you are. Now there's one problem here though. What if you don't love your wife? What if you realize one day that you're not in love with her? Maybe you were before and you no longer are. Maybe you realize you were never in love with her in the first place. Maybe you don't know what love is. I mean, they say you remain the same age that you were when you get famous, right? In the case of Ned Fulmer, he got famous when he was 27. A lot of people have really bad conceptions of love at 37, let alone 27. So what happens psychologically in that moment? Of course you struggle with it. Of course you feel inadequate. You feel like it compromises that very self-image of being a good guy. Because good guys love their wives and bad guys lie about loving their wives and don't actually love them, right? Well, for one, when you feel inadequate, you do the things that give you pleasure and make you not feel pain. That's what we could call Freud's pleasure principle. In the Fort Da experiment that he has with his grandson, he sees the pleasure principle as his grandson taking the agency in a situation that he usually doesn't. Specifically, it's this young grandson's experience of his mother constantly going in and out of the house, constantly being absent, that makes him enjoy this Fort Da game or this leave stay game because it's now him in the position that gets to say, I'm staying and I'm leaving. You subvert the situation to gain agency over it so it normalizes your experience, but also makes you feel almost vengeful and, and, and pleased by being in the position now where you're not at the whims of somebody else. And we all experience some degree of this, kinda, right? Like, we all get overzealous growing up because now we're starting to get this agency that we've been wanting our whole lives. We gain all this pleasure from subverting the life that we've become accustomed to, where we have to follow our parents' orders the whole time and where sometimes that can be unfair to us. So you combine that feeling with being rich, famous, and having that self-image where you actually deserve good things and all of the great 
crazy things that you have are because of your merit and your integrity, which are things that you don't even have to prove because they're natural to you. Oh my goodness. Well, you might do something like cheat on your wife who you constantly perform your love towards for approval of other people with a coworker who works underneath you considering all the legal ramifications of that and is also engaged at that. Again, this is alleged, but again, the evidence is fairly compelling. All these things seem super bizarre to us, but they're ultimately reactions that are created by social systems, which tell people that they can do whatever they want because they're famous. So now let's finally address Hank Green's tweet before we go, and we'll talk about parasocial stuff. If you're interested in more of me talking about parasocial relationships, check out our video on Bo Burnham. So Hank Green tweeted on the 27th, publicly speculating on a part of a person's life that they are clearly trying to keep private isn't part of being a fan, it's weird, and I don't like it. Now, this is a generalized comment by Hank Green, and it could be about a bunch of different situations. When applied specifically to the Ned Fulmer situation, it's a little fuzzy, but in general, it's a pretty solid point. There's a certain degree of responsibility you have to have over your own actions, and there's a degree of respect of people's private lives that you're expected to uphold, whether you're a fan of them or not. However, this is where I think we should talk about parasocial relationships really quickly, and there's so much more to dive into that I will never get the chance to probably because I'm constantly thinking about this. Parasocial relationships are the foundation of celebrity in our digital age. And they're not by definition the creepy, obsessive, stalker fan type. They're any interaction you have with some sort of content creator or media figure who you don't have a personal relationship with. I'm making a video, you're watching it, you don't know me, but I have certain personality traits that are coming out or things that I seem like. And so you're taking those things into account. You're building an opinion of me. This is a parasocial interaction. Similarly, we're reading Hank Green's tweet and we don't know Hank Green personally, at least I don't, but we know him parasocially. We know his brother, John, we know the vlog brothers, etc. Now, parasocial relationships are something that can be cultivated and that are very often cultivated by celebrities to build their status and their wealth and to just build a career. It's a reality of everybody who's trying to make something in the public. And oftentimes we do this through constant exposure and honesty, or at least performing honesty. And many of the people who are so often caught up in parasocial relationships, which to be frank, is all of us at times. I don't care if it's LeBron James or if it's James Charles or if it's Curtis Connor, like somebody you have at one point had a intense parasocial relationship with. Like if you've yelled at a basketball player because he always makes certain decisions and he doesn't train enough in the off season, that's a parasocial relationship. And specifically, people are often looking for male role models or just healthy male figures in their lives because a lot of us grow up with non-healthy male figures. Unhealthy is the word that exists. Unhealthy male figures. That's from our fathers. Some of us have bad relationships with our fathers. Some of us have bad relationships with male friends or male teachers or whoever. And so it can be really compelling for us when a famous guy shows these moral traits that we can admire, like being a wife guy. This can be a way for us to be optimistic about men. It can give us new perspective on how to be a good man. It can give us good perspective on the kind of man we would want to be with or be friends with. But at the same time, there's first of all, a lot of unhealthy dynamics at play there. There's a lot of things that could go bad. And especially in the latter case, like people love when parasocial relationships go bad. They love to obsess over it. They love drama. We love Twitch dramas. We love YouTuber dramas. We love celebrity dramas like these. And we specifically love to call celebrities manipulative and evil, and then sometimes at the same time also call their audiences easily manipulated and obsessed. And for a lot of us, that's a reaction to the trauma and the betrayals we've experienced. We experienced the kind of Fort Da thing because we have dealt with that kind of thing in our own lives. And so it becomes a lot more enjoyable to laugh at the displeasure of other people experiencing it in their own lives. Like we've had our own times where we've looked up to somebody and they've let us down. And so it can be a lot of very nuanced and weird sort of therapy almost to sit here and say, hey, you know what? You shouldn't have never trusted that guy and ha 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 and look at you. But we also just really love to, to talk about why celebrities and how celebrities manipulate us. And I'll just sort of say like, there's a lot of trust issues going on there and a lot of things that we gotta be mindful of and maybe we'll talk about that more another day. But 
Also, with regards to Hank Green's tweet, I don't think it's wrong for people to debate this subject. I don't think it's wrong for people to sometimes pry into these celebrities' lives. I mean, for one, right, we just talked about how these celebrities build all this capital and all these unhealthy dynamics in their personal lives off of, in part, performing all of these things to us and building these parasocial relationships with us so that we build this trust with them and so that we give them money. And so when there's a situation when that person's image is completely changed and they don't live up to what they've been saying that they are, yeah, it's perfectly valid for people to dig into that. It's perfectly valid for people to feel hurt by that. Ned Fulmer made himself a public subject, a public subject who loved his wife, and he rose to wealth and status and likability because of things like that. And not only did he betray those dynamics, betray that public image that he staked, for which he became so empowered, he created really negative situations in people's lives. I mean, there's a child involved. I mean, cheating is a serious thing. My friend Awa tweeted about this the other day. Cheating is a very deep and serious thing. It is not all ha-ha and funny and oh my god. Like, it is a serious offense that can really, really affect people. And it doesn't help that the people that are affected in this case are by and large people that we also have parasocial relationships with. People that we also have reason to believe are honest and good people. And even if they weren't, nobody deserves to be betrayed. Let me say that again so it's clear to everybody. Nobody deserves to be betrayed. It doesn't matter if you're a fan. It doesn't matter if you're a family member. And as a fan, there are certain times where you can feel betrayed by something that you shouldn't, but that's another story. In this case, this was an actively horrible thing that a person did, and it's right for people to feel bad about that and to want to learn about it, especially because there are legal ramifications. There are ramifications for the future of that company and whether or not people will choose to support that company in the Try Guys. So yeah, I understand people digging into it and researching it and, and discussing it at length. I also think that Hank makes a great point in that at the very least he's alluding to a lot of situations in which that's really weird and bad. Because for one, people get really overzealous, they dox people and they harass people, and these are not separate elements, right? This is an unfortunate and really problematic reality of fan dynamics. Shit goes way overboard and it's not as simple as just telling people don't go overboard because everybody's got a different line and especially when you have anonymity over the internet, who's gonna check me for doxing somebody, right? And also, sometimes you just gotta let shit go. Like, yeah, maybe as a fan, you were betrayed by this. Maybe this was a horrible thing that you saw somebody you looked up to do and it's really affecting you and there's all these different parts of it that could potentially have other ramifications. But at a certain point, you do have to kind of be like, okay, like anything that isn't very clear things for the public to see is something that I should approach with caution. Like evidence and arguments and counter arguments about guilt in certain situations, those are all things that have nuance, but like at a certain point, you don't need to Google shit. You don't need to look people up. You definitely do not need to be commenting on people's Instagrams, asking them what happened. At a certain point, you gotta kinda go, well, shit, and then move on. That's where I'll leave it today. I hope that this was a fun conversation for you guys. I hope that it helped you explore some interesting ideas. If so, like and subscribe and leave a comment and let me know what you thought. Put the notifications on because I go live on Saturdays, almost every Saturday. And I also will be posting more frequently so you can check out my stuff. I have a Kofi in the description if you want to donate to help me get a new camera and a new computer and other things that I will need because everything is really expensive. Thank you for watching The Elliot Show. Have a good one. And um, just try to be healthy. Yeah. <laughs>